Good evening and welcome everybody. We are, so happy, we are so happy you joined us tonight. I'm Terry Kay of the Jewish Grandparents Network. That's okay. And tonight we have another experience in the, in the Family Room Live series with the, tonight we're very happy to welcome Dr. Lisa Miller. The Family Room went live last week. I want to take 30 seconds to show you what it looks like. I'm uh, hoping you can all see my screen. Mm -hmm. The family room is an online space for grandparents to find experiences, activities, and resources that can enrich their relationship with their grandchildren with Jewish culture and values and traditions. I know, it is located on the grandparents network, Jewish grandparents network uh, website. You click on the family room. And you can choose the activities that you would like to do with your grandchildren for ex in, in different categories, different destinations. There's gardening in the earth, there is play, cooking and food, the I arts, think so. and so on. I didn't notice any brochures. We will put, ask her if they have any brochures in the area. Uh, can everybody please put your phones <laughs> on mute? I think that's Jill. Um, would you mind please putting your phone on mute? Thank you. We will uh, share a link in the chat box uh, soon so that you can go explore the family room on your own. Uh, I do want to emphasize that the family room is an asynchronous experience. It's not live. So you do it in your own time with your grandchildren. Three quick notes before I introduce Dr. Lisa Miller. One, if you have a question, please write it in the chat box and we will make time throughout the discussion to hear from you. We really would value and appreciate your participation. Two, because we have a large group here tonight, we recommend that you change it's your a grandparents view at the top uh, of the video. screen from, from a gallery view to speaker view so that the person who is speaking will show up big and clear in the middle of your screen. Uh, we, the third point I'd like to make is that we have exactly 50 minutes together and we will sign off shop at 7.50 p.m. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Dr. Lisa Miller, who is a New York Times best-selling author of The Spiritual Child and most recently, The Awakened Brain. Lisa is a professor of, uh, is a professor in the clinical psychology program at Teachers College at Columbia University and is the founder and director of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, which is the first Ivy League graduate program and research institute in spirituality and psychology. And Lisa's also held over a decade of joint appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Lisa is also an award-winning researcher. During the course of the during the course of our discussion, we will post links to these books in the chat. Tonight, Lisa will be interviewed by the co-founder and CEO of the Jewish Grandparents Network, David Raphael. So, over to you, David and Lisa. Well, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see you, and it's wonderful to uh, meet you, Lisa. Um, you know, I read your book when I was on vacation. It was the perfect companion. It was on a beautiful house overlooking the um, Pacific Ocean. And it was this incredibly spiritual time for me. And it was about the quickest I've ever read in a nonfiction book ever. It's wonderfully written uh, and beautifully re readable, but it's also very personal. Um, you talk about personal challenges and how they along with your research and professional life, led you to a greater sense of spirituality and purpose. Could you speak about that for a moment, please? Thank you, David, and thank you, Terry. And may I say what a joy it is to move through the Zoom and see everyone's face. Um, there's some people I know, and there's some people I'm just getting a chance now to connect with. And I feel right now here, part of the community um, and part of a Jewish community. So thank you for including me. Um, there's, I, I would have to say, there's no one who has meant more to me in my life than my four grandparents. 
And so, of course, I'm thinking of my grandparents right now as I'm with you and the extraordinary impact that my grandparents have made on me as a Jew and as a spiritual person. So I just want to start by saying that and putting that in the center. Um, and now, David, I will answer your question. Okay, so it is a personal book. Um, I am a clinical scientist of over 20 years. And the whole time that I've been a scientist, I've also been a woman, a mother, a daughter. And I think that it's essential to lift back the veil behind science to see the scientist, to understand really the deeper meaning of the questions. And when the findings come out as they come out through the empirical method, what significance they might hold. You know, science has a tendency to be published in a way that can seem pretty flat as a board, sort of two-dimensional. But I think when we see the scientist's life, um, you know, who's that man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz who, who really um, is sharing this story, the significance of, of the, it becomes far greater. So I'll share with you a, a bit of the story from the awakened brain. Um, the awakened brain is, as David says, a weaving together of personal narrative, mine and fellow pe people who've all journeyed through difficult times. Um, and the mirror of that human narrative through the lens of empirical science. At the time that I was starting out um, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, not much was written at all in the peer review science on spirituality, religion, in mental health, in recovery and development, not much at all. But I could see plain as day in my patients up on 168th Street at Columbia Presbyterian that those patients who traveled through times of depression and despair or loss and carried with them a deep connection to God, Hashem, the higher power, whatever word they might use, and they were of all faith traditions, had an entirely different course of recovery. So a mental health science silent on spiritual life did not make sense to me. And as I was noting this big donut size hole in the parameters of the mental health fields, psychiatry, psychology, social work, as a human being, I was also living out a journey that was increasingly becoming rife with depression. My husband and I at about 30 had built the careers we wanted. We had the apartment we wanted. We had wonderful friends. We had everything we thought we wanted. Um, when we really started feeling that our lives seemed pretty empty without children. So we started trying, if you will. Um, and after two months, three months, four months, we thought that's so strange. You know, you're healthy, I'm healthy. Why are there no babies here? So we did what people often did, which is we took a vacation. <laughs> we went down to the Caribbean and we thought now there'll be babies. And we came back and didn't take long to discover, no, we still were not pregnant. So we ratcheted up our efforts and we started going to fertility doctors, you know, to get an opinion. And the opinion was, you're both healthy. You know, we'll just try a little bit of, in, um, you know, IUI. We'll try to, you know, a little assisted technology. And after six or seven months and trials of that, still in my baby, we tried IVF in vitro and, you know, found the fellow in our home, home area, our home state who had the highest rates of success, booked an appointment, went a couple rounds with him and still no baby. And as this was starting to become more and more disappointing, each failed in vitro started to feel like a loss, um, almost as if there'd been a funeral for a little tiny could have been baby. Um, and being a researcher and a scientist, I thought, well, we've just got to find a better team. We've got to find, here we go, the team that invented in vitro. And indeed we found the team at UPenn who on sea urchins and Woods Hole had invented in vitro. We met with them, they were a superb team, but all the while that we were moving and upping the ante to um, more skilled, more so-called you know, higher rate success in vitro doctors, fertility doctors, I had this creeping feeling in my heart that while that might be the right office for a fellow woman or a fellow set of a married couple looking for a baby, for us, for me in my heart, I just had an intuition that I was in the wrong place. Sure. Yeah. So there we were, um, more and more failures until finally we went to the team with the highest success rate in the whole country. 
and lying there side by side, my husband and I, he was there out of solidarity on bed rest you know, right after the procedure. I picked up the remote, struck the button and the TV wouldn't budge. It was stuck on one channel. And I thought, well, that's strange. I mean, we'd splurged, we'd found a nice hotel. What, why they have a broken TV and it wouldn't move at all. So I listened, there was only one channel and to our amazement, what was on TV was the voice of an orphan. It was a homeless child living in a garbage dump um, somewhere in South America. And this little boy through the voice of the translator said, I don't care that I can't go to school. He's probably about eight years old. I don't care that I can't go to school. I don't care that I live in a garbage dump, but it hurts so much to not be loved that I sniff glue to make the pain go away. And having now been through about eight or nine rounds of in vitro fertilization, I looked at my husband and he said, you know, I think there's a child out there for us. It occurred to me that I had been blind to what parenting really is, which is of course, deep love and commitment. And I had created my own misery this whole time. He needed a mom this little boy on the garbage dump and I needed a child and we could have been a family. And once that realization set hold, everything seemed to shift. We were out of this abject deep misery. And instead, all sorts of people started showing up, some we'd known a long time, some we'd never met before, helping us. For instance, I'm sitting on the bus, um, the in vitro as you might've imagined that we'd conducted before being on the TV, did not take. And I was feeling kind of depressed and, and sitting in the back of the bus going up to Columbia. And a, a gentleman came on the bus and I was, because I was feeling sort of depressed, I wasn't particularly seeking company at the moment. And I kind of hoped he wouldn't walk towards me, but he did. And I thought, oh no, you know, I'm not really up to it. And the gentleman walks all the way down and in a big empty bus, sits right down beside me. And that is how synchronicity works. It's always a little bit annoying at first because it's a perturbation. It upheaves the rigidity of the ego. And the gentleman starts to speak and he says, you know, you look awfully nice. And I thought, oh no. He said, actually, you look just like that type of woman who would go all around the world adopting children. Whoa. And one, what I might call trail angel after the next, kept showing up. The, the finest, of course, was my very own mother who called one day and said, I just had a little message for you. My mother is the rabbi, priestess, shaman in my life. I just wanted you to know that our neighbor down the way, she's just adopted an adorable little boy, little Daniel. And Daniel is so sweet and he just, you know, is so excited to be part of the family. And we want you to know that Daniel was adopted from Russia. Just, just letting you know, bye. Yeah. <laughs> so the message was pretty clear. What was life showing me now? Life was showing me that indeed there was a child out there for us and we just had to find him or her. And that was where the tide turned and we started looking for our spiritual child. And there were a number of they could only be called miracles. And I think everyone who adopts a child, anyone who comes into their child through any means knows that it's a miracle through which family is formed. And indeed it was love and commitment that made us a very, very joyful family. But wow. the depression wasn't going to be treated by changing my thoughts. You know, who am I? I'm not, you know, am I such a loser? Cognitive therapy. Am I, am I you know, lost without motherhood? It wasn't about debating or changing my thoughts. It was about giving up the rigid ideas of how life was to be, surrendering strategy and tactics as I top down wanted to impute on life. And instead starting to witness life, life full of messengers and guides and helpers, life with frank directives. You look just like the type of woman who should go all around the world adopting children. And instead of being a maker of my path, the depression lifted when I realized that I was in dialogue with life, that there was a loving guiding presence. I say God in and through life. And when I became more aware of the relationship to the guidance from the spirit in and through life, I was no longer depressed. Even before I had Isaiah, life felt abundant. Life felt full of surprise. Life felt 
good and loving, even if I didn't get what I wanted as I thought I might have wanted it. Wow. So um, I want to somehow in the, if we in time we have, get back to the phrase to use messengers, guides, and mentors, and think about that as we talk about grandparents. Um, but all of us have gone through over the last two years, uh, all of us have had painful experiences, and certainly the last two years have been painful for many uh, through the COVID pandemic. So from your experience and your perspective, two questions. What is the path to learn and grow from these experiences? And two, focusing on grandparents, how can we help our grandchildren and family members not just survive, but grow and thrive and perhaps become even more spiritual? David, that's such a beautiful question because you know, when we think about the grandchildren, people who are children or teenagers, there's a lot of times that teenagers or even young adults feel like the past 18 months <clears throat> sort of was a pothole in the road of their life. And somehow it was downtime or wasted time. But, you know, in truth, we don't know what the decades ahead will hold. God willing, our children and grandchildren will be safe. But it is very likely that teenagers now will inherit a world with a lot of dynamism, a lot of flux. So that the idea that in life we make our lot, that if I get A plus B plus C in order, it's going to lead to D. You know, I get my good grades and I'm going to be a good citizen and therefore I'm going to get into this college and I'm going to have a great job and that we somehow control our lot. Well, control is actually kind of a thin layer of icing on a big town cake of dynamism and flux. And when our strategizing and our tactics don't square with the deeper nature of life, as we've seen in the past 18 months, life has direction of its own, then the idea that command control can build a life that is secure, that is prosperous, that is as we had thought it should be, is really not a very, um, that won't hold water. It just doesn't square with life. What the past 18 months has shown us is that there's another way to live, which is to say, what is life showing me now? Okay, I can't go to school. Okay, you know, the hospital is not receiving people. You know, our institutions aren't gonna take care of us every minute of our lives. What really is life showing me now? And that is a relationship that is much more creative. It is much more go with the flow. It is one where we invite a child or a grandchild to pray and ask God for guidance or meditate and connect into the deeper direction of life. It's one in which the parts of the brain that quickly add together variables. You know, I'm gonna get this lined up and then this and next, and then I'm gonna to get to the red door. I'm gonna throw up in that red door and what I wanted is mine. Well, when we get there and the red door is jammed and it's stuck, you know, we might kick the red door a few times and get frustrated or depressed and helpless. But if we just say, you know, the red door stuck and pivot, very often there's a yellow door. And the yellow door, I could have walked right by it a hundred times and never seen it had the red door not been stuck. And it could lead to meeting someone or a new career direction or a deeper way of being in which I'm in relationship to God or life. The yellow door could hold a promise that I never would have known had I only been kicking, kicking, kicking the closed red door. And that process is a process that happens when we engage, if we pray, if we engage a more spiritual way of being, we go from using a top-down dorsal attention network to a bottom-up ventral attention network, which has much more abundant information. And many people say the right answer pops. It's the felt sense of guidance. So in contrast to what might be called the achieving brain or a stance of achieving awareness, we can put our hand on the gear shift and choose to enter a stance of awakened awareness where life is much more flexible, where we live in the here and now. And instead of trying to paddle through a tsunami in a little rowboat, we try to go with the tidal wave and go, where is life taking us now? Um, it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue with life. And it's one that involves intuition. It's one that involves instinct, mystical awareness, forms of receptive knowing. 
forms of receptive perception. And I call that awakened awareness. I think what might be said is that it is the neuro seat of transcendent awareness. So um, I'm intrigued um, by helping our grandkids find the yellow door. Um, and um, I'd like for a second to connect your research and your work with that of Marshall Duke and Robin Feimersch, who talk about the importance of family narratives in promoting emotional well being and emotional resilience uh, in children. And so it seems to me, as our grandchildren are navigating these complicated times and searching for the family, for the yellow door, there could be a, a real valuable role for grandparents oh, yeah. to share their yellow door stories or their red door stories. Can you just talk about that a bit? Absolutely. The gift of a story is almost the gift of 10 years of life, right? It is highly condensed, high pixel mm -hmm. information. And most faith traditions, certainly including ours, has a notion of witness that we give testimony to the presence of God, of the glory of life in and through stories. So that is very condensed wisdom, your story. And in particular, a story that involves a spiritual redirection, an awakening, a connection to God, a discovery. Your spiritual story is the hope diamond for your grandchild. Science shows us that in the form, every single one of us is born with the innate capacity for spiritual awareness. We know this through twin siblings. Every single one of us, just as we're born with, you know, eye color and a temperament, we are born with a capacity for spiritual life. How much so? It is one third of our endowment. And the other two thirds is from how we are raised how our parents and grandparents shape and embrace our innate spiritual core. Is it strong or does it atrophy? The way that the spiritual core is built, when we look through the lens of science, we find an equal contribution from parents and grandparents walking the walk of spiritual values and parents and grandparents talking the walk, transparency, sharing their own deep, spiritual experience. So let me give an example of both. Walking the walk. I think of my grandmother, Grandma Harriet, and Grandma Harriet loved to pray so much so that when she, my grandmother, my mother, and I were all together, maybe we'd had tea or we were laughing or we were sitting outside, my mother would say, mom, my mother to her mother, mom, would you like to pray now? And my grandma's eyes would sparkle. She just loved to pray. And they'd all get their prayer books and we'd sit down and they're in the middle of the backyard on lawn chairs, would read from the prayer books. And it was, there was such a love and such a joy. When I think of prayer, I think of my grandma's eyes sparkling. I think of the prayer book through the generations. I think we don't need synagogues beautiful, but we can also be in lawn chairs in the backyard. That is walking the walk. What else is walking the walk? Caring for fellow living beings, uh, tikkun alum, charity, sadaka. So uh, my grandmother lived in Des Moines, Iowa. And I remember being there in February when it was bitter, <laughs> bitter, bitter cold. And there were icicles hanging from the edge of her house. And I looked over and she looked really terribly sad. Ready? And I, said, and I said, Grandma Harriet, what is it? Grandma. And she said, well, and she didn't even want to hurt my heart. She looked down and a little bird had frozen to death in the cold Iowa winter. The compassion that she had walking the walk of love for fellow living beings, for God's creation. So these are examples of walking the walk. Now, talking the walk is letting the grandchild know what your spiritual experience is. So for instance, you know, if you were to tell a story, um, I'll share one of mine. You know, there was a time when I was 19, when as much as I had prayed and felt identified with Judaism and been a spiritual person all my life, I was there in college and I'd read all sorts of philosophers saying that God didn't exist. I had met all sorts of people who almost made fun of me for thinking that God exists. And for the first time in my life, I wondered, well, what if God doesn't exist? And it was a very existentially barren place to be. It was terrifying and it was depressing. And there was nothing I could read through my courses in college that would 
prove to me that God existed. I took philosophy and I took religious studies. And, but then, you know, sitting by my grandparents' side in synagogue and that summer walking by the water and seeing light upon the ocean and suddenly living and feeling firsthand a perception, a receptive knowing of love, of buoyancy. I could know in my heart that God existed. So I couldn't prove it with my head alone, but I could ask the question with my head and receive the answer with my heart. That's a story of, for my life at 19. If I tell my daughter that, then she's cued to know that there are times that deeply spiritual people feel lost and questioned. Then she's cued to know that not everything can be answered with our head. We have multiple forms of knowing. And most of all, our relationship goes from how are you doing to how was school today to sharing one of the most poignant moments in my life. And she feels open to do the same. So when we share our own spiritual path, my mother would cry in the, spontaneously in the middle of dinner and say, ah, oh, the sunset is so beautiful. And I see you and your brother in front of the sunset and God is so good and God has given us so much. It was talking the walk, transparency into her own spiritual life. And of course, at Shabbat, my mother would light the candles and pray and sing with so much heart and tears were in her eyes. So Shabbat for me means my mother, my grandmother, my father, my grandfather's awe and reverence. It means my ancestors and my lineage participating in this transcendent love of God. It doesn't mean just here now the book and me. Walking the walk and talking the walk, when we look through the lens of science, are perhaps about 90% of the story on how the spiritual child is formed. And you don't need to agree with the parents to use your own spiritual voice. They have their voice and you authentically and your voice have your spiritual view. You're not indoctrinating, you're sharing yourself. There's no love in the world like the love of a grandparent. There is nothing like it. And the sweetness and the taste of your love, your pure delight, your pure unconditional love gets intertwined with the grandchild's experience of God's love because in some sense they are one and the same. And in fact, we've interviewed hundreds, hundreds of teenagers and we've heard from many people, you know, my grandparents, they've listened to me. I mean, when I speak at the kitchen table, they really listen. And sometimes they pray with me by their side. So when I think of God, it's kind of God and my grandparents all, all rolled up into one. That's lovely. You know, um, you tell a beautiful story actually in both of your books uh, that I think is sharing. It, it comes, I think, from a, a grandmother and a granddaughter from a different faith tradition in a different racial tradition. It was the experience you had on the subway. And I just found that so powerful. It's really what it's about is how we teach our grandkids about staka, about social justice, about uh, making uh, other people feel important. Would you mind just sharing that story briefly? And then we're gonna open up the floor for other questions. Sure. Um, you know, this was a time before I was a mother. So I say BC before children where my time and calendar looked a little bit different. So this was a Sunday and I was headed up on the number one subway up Broadway from our apartment to Columbia, because at that time to run the numbers, you had to be at the computer at the mainframe at the, at the campus. So I'm standing on the subway platform and it is hot because it's August and a train finally comes. And I think fabulous, here comes the train and it rolls right by. It happens in New York. So I wait a little bit longer and another train comes and sure enough, it rolls right by. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, one finally stops. And as you might imagine, that subway car is packed except for one space. So I hop on that one car. I get into that empty space feeling very clever. And then I quickly see why there's empty space, which is there's a gentleman, a homeless man who as each person gets on addresses them hey, you want to come sit with me? And everybody looks startled and runs to the far end of the car until the next stop, 86th Street. Hey, you, you want some of my lunch? And he starts tossing his lunch and everyone runs to the far end of the car. And this goes over and over. And with each person's absolute negation of his existence, which each person's 
flat ignoring him, he gets more and more agitated and speaks louder. 96, 103, 125, we're getting all at 145, the door opens up and on walks a regal couple. It is a grandmother in green pastel with a white pillbox hat and white gloves and her little granddaughter in matching white gloves and a pink pastel dress. So the whole car cringes because we know what's coming. And sure enough, hey, you, you, do you wanna sit with me? The grandmother and the granddaughter look at each other, nod, and walk right to the homeless gentleman and sit right by his side. And he's stunned. Everyone's ignored him all day. And this grandmother and granddaughter dress so beautifully sit by him touching. Hey, to test it, you want some of my lunch? The grandmother and the granddaughter nod, not a word is said, and in unison, no thank you. And this goes round and he can't believe he's being seen. He can't believe that he is regarded as a being with dignity, as what I might say a soul on earth. They never said a word other than no thank you, the gentleman. And yet what they were doing was so clearly the intergenerational transmission of values, the passing of the torch. We don't make the light, but we pass it. And the torch was being passed. That granddaughter knew exactly what that moment meant. Grandma had walked the walk, grandma had talked the walk. Right? And what went through my ear on a Sunday was that this lovely couple was off to church. What you do to the least of these, you do to me. It was absolutely the beginning of the realization that, and all the data came to stack this way, that when spiritual values are passed through generations, they lay more deeply when they're picked up by just one generation or by the child themselves all alone. In fact, if you look at the intergenerational transmission, the passing the torch of spiritual life, when it is passed from grandparent to parent, the grandchild, Levadora Vador, the grandchild is 90% protected against major depression when they go through the window of risk, which is 16 through 26 of first onset. Wow. So it is the interweaving of spiritual values in the family that in each moment explains why do we behave and what does it really mean in terms of our ultimate relationship with life and God. Wow. Beautiful. David, thank you. David, may I jump in with a question from our friend? Yes, please. Uh, I would you. suggest that. Uh, Laura has asked uh, a rather intriguing question. She said, Lisa, what suggestions do you have for religious school curriculum that would be more helpful compared to what we had as children? Anything. Sorry. <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. Um, I think that the best thing you could do is have a grandparents day whether it's on Zoom or in person, where the grandparent tells the child a moment of deep spiritual meaning in their life. And you don't, you don't even need to go to religious school for this. You can do it in your family. A moment of deep spiritual meaning in your life. Maybe even if you can locate one from when you were a few years around the age of the grandchild. I mean, that is, that is a jewel. They will remember that forever, forever. It's live spirituality, it's live Judaism. Um, Lisa, what have you heard people say when, when you ask that question? Well, I can share with you one from my own life. Um, this is from my father. Um, when my father was in his mid-40s, his mother passed. And I remember getting up, as I always did, at about 5 a.m. the following morning coming downstairs and seeing my father sitting on the carpet in the living room. He wasn't on the couch. He wasn't, he was sitting on the carpet, just thinking. I'd found him there. I'd never seen him there. And it's still dark out so early in the morning. And I remember looking at him and so what are you doing here? And he said, you know, grandma Ellie, who just passed, he said, she came to me last night in my dream. And grandma Ellie loved to dress up. She wore beautiful jewelry and beautiful clothes. But in this dream, said my father, she was wearing a very everyday gray suit 
and we were walking down Grand Avenue in Des Moines, Iowa, where we had walked so many times together before. And I took it to mean that my mother had always walked with me and would continue to walk with me. Now, my father was a very skeptical academic. My mother was shamanic and cried. My father was always kind of, but he shared something that was so raw and so real. And what it did was it made me certain that indeed my grandma did walk with me and that for always she would. It also made me feel like that was the depth of my relationship with my father. I mean, he never asked about my grades. He didn't you know, ask if I came in first, second or third for my track meets. That's where he lived, where things mattered. And the more that he shared stories in the moment of where he was spiritually or from his boyhood, you know, the more I felt that I really knew him in a deep, deep way in the heart, a very deep way in the heart. Um, I'll share you some, with you some other stories. There's beautiful stories where we've heard, you know, people talk about the time that, you know, the uh, grandparents have talked about the time that um, the child that they're talking to was having his breasts or having his naming and what it was like to watch the grandchild as a baby be named or have a briss and feel like that God and received the blessing and that God had given them this grandchild. You know, the story about the formation of you, grandparent and grandchild, that, that will rivet, absolutely rivet the grandchild. Um, there's so many beautiful stories. And oftentimes, you know, the story itself may have happened in four minutes, but it's one of those life-giving moments. It's one of those sacred moments in life it's sort of the opposite of a traumatic moment. It's this healing, regenerative, life-giving moment that it's like the diamond in the middle of the crown. The child will always remember. And in that moment, they know that God exists and you loved them and that you were the messenger to them of God. So much is in that moment. There's a question we want to ask from, from uh, Lee Hendler and uh, Meyer Hop Hendler in a minute, but I want to follow up on something you briefly alluded to in that question. I think it was your father or your grandfather who never asked you about your grades or yeah. just really concerned about your spirituality. And I was intrigued at, uh, in your book about the research of uh, Sunita Luthar, who conducted research with children, rich kids, in going to expensive schools. Mm -hmm. And she, what she said is the majority of affluent kids in her study had perceptions of co contingent love, contingent love from their parents and families. Many of the kids said that they felt like commodities. Their job was to perform academically, athletically, musically, and learn and earn their parents' approval. Endless attention was paid to report cards and trophies and ranking. No one said, I'm happy to see you. So, you know, um, I'd like to feel that grandparents have a really special role to play here. But I also feel that we need to be careful and respectful of the role that parents play. Do you have any guidance on how grandparents could kind of send that message of how important they are? You know, we love them in spite of their grades or in, because of their grades. Well, perhaps one of the most profound experiences is when a grandparent looks, looks at a grandchild, you see them into a fuller way of being. Right? You're not measuring them. You're literally whole unconditional love that more of them comes forward. You love them as your grandchild, as their beautiful soul. And they feel that. So simply being in your loving, unconditional regard is very different than how the math tests go. What happened today? Did you pass? You know, so that's really cannot be underestimated. The other thing is that indeed, as you say, Children, um, particularly in well-resourced communities, have a feeling that they somehow need to sing for their supper, that there's more sparkle in their parents' eyes, they get more attention if they scored a goal or won the match or came home with an A and AP chemistry, then they might witness sparkle and love and attention if they were praying or if they were simply being by their parents' side, the gift of being side by side. The difference between do, 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 and be, 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 doing and being. Okay. So, you know, we started to say there's no love like the love of a grandparent. I, I feel that, first of all, 
you know, knowing that if I come to you as your grandchild with a C, you love me just as much. You're just as excited to see me as if I came to you with an A. And that when you see me, the thrill is in seeing me, right? That's the love of a grandparent. It is, it is the most unconditional, encompassing, divine love. You know, when you look at MRI studies, the docking station of the spiritual brain, what I call the awakened brain, through which we receive a connection to our higher power, to God, is the same docking station in the brain, the same circuits that allow us to feel divinity, sacredness, God's presence in and through one another. So that's why children and teens so often say, when I think of God, it's sort of God and my grandparents all rolled up into one. It is the same seed of perception, pure, unconditional love. Now, it doesn't matter whether their parents, you know, do or do not carry unconditional love, are religious or not. Your relationship spoken authentically in the first person it never oversteps bounds. It's pure love. It's your first person voice. And if a grandparent is to say, you know, um, I love to light Shabbat candles because I feel close to God, that is your voice. And five minutes of your voice a month is enough to turn the tide. There is a process of selective spiritual socialization because we are innately spiritual beings, not a blank slate, not a tabla rasa. The child will turn and drink in, drink from the well of the most, most full, healthy form of spirituality they hear. So all they need is an eyedropper. All they need is your voice, literally five minutes, once, you know, lighting Shabbat candles with you once a month. And they know that grandma and grandpa, who I love so much, feel God's presence and they do this, right? So you're not asking the parent to do it differently. You're sharing robustly and fully your truth. You are walking the walk and talking the walk. You're being transparent onto your own spiritual life in the presence of your grandchild. And that is powerful. That is, and it's powerful enough to be the one person or two people in their lives that they take in from whom they received the torch to know that yes, God is real and Judaism is a path in to that felt presence with God. Lisa, yes. Lisa, I, I feel compelled to say that whatever you're saying about grandparents, we should add in for great grandparents too. Absolutely. And the reason is that my own parents who are both alive and my dad just got out of the hospital today are on this call. And I know that they're saying to each other, what about the great grandparents? So, um, I, I, I want to add that we have exactly five minutes left till you have to leave, Lisa. So uh, maybe we can get in at least one more question, perhaps two, and I'll tell, I'll tell you when it's 7.50. So Lee Hendler asks, how can grandparents who live far from their grandchildren exercise the wonderful influence you cite? Good. So I think that Zoom is about... 85, 90% as good as being there when it comes to drinking in the message. And you know, we did, for instance, in our home, we did Passover over the Zoom and my parents, the grandparents led Passover. Um, so being there by Zoom, being there by phone, um, when you do make a visit, maybe a longer visit, you know, so you are there when you come in through Zoom or the phone. You are there when you write them emails and when you call them and if you can text them, you've really hit a very receptive um, arena. So you know, joining them where they are, um, you know, the bottom line is that many grandchildren right now live on a screen. So you can connect with them on a screen in the way they connect with their friends and they correct them. It, it is a psychologically real space for them. Um, it is very much alive. The other thing is stories, 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 stories. You know, it's one thing to go back and forth, but you could maybe say, I want to share with you each month a story. And it could be a story in your path that is deeply meaningful, that has lots of heart, that maybe involves your relationship to God or life itself. Um, those are treasures and they will be riveted. They will be absolutely riveted. They can be stories from when you were their age. They can be stories when you saw them born, as we talked about. They can be stories from the here and now. Something so beautiful happened to me today. I want to tell you an experience. It can be a difficult story. Um, teens 
we know through longitudinal twin studies that the heritable capacity for spirituality boots up. There's a biological clock from 13 bar mitzvah, 1520 up to 25. There's a hunger for life's ultimate truth to know it's real. What is life about? What am I about in the world? That's hardwired and a yearning of the heart to connect in a deeply true way. And we know that teens of all of us are perhaps the best at smelling what's true and of using their inner compass. It's spiritual individuation, the me and not me. Everything you've ever told me, Judaism, mom, dad, I wanna test it against my inner compass. Well, they are truth seekers. And if you choose to share something in this very receptive, high impact window of spiritual formation, again, 13 to about 24, they will take that as, you know, that is manna from heaven, that is hard data and it will shape them. So that's a tremendous gift. Well, you know, on that note, let, let's, let's end with this question, which is, which is a very real question. What if our grandchildren are not interested in the, gra in the grandparents written or in the moment stories? You know, they're, they're into Minecraft, they're whatever, what should they wear for Halloween, whatever it is. So what other ways can the storytelling occur? Okay, thank you. That's a lovely question. Um, the first thing I might share is, and it won't surprise anyone on this call, is that very often it appears as if our stories are not being listened to. Um, but when you're not there, and the science shows this, the depth and register of their very private conversations with their friends online or in person actually replicate the depth and register of your stories to them. So even if you know, it appears as if it's not getting in, it, it very likely is. Um, and part of the sequestered secretness and privacy and you know, sort of elevating the teen social world, um, you're still in there. You're still in there. Um, so that, that's what yeah, I- and, and, and there are other tools. Uh, our, our dear friend who's on this call, Jane Isay, uh, she's also on the National Advisory Council for the Jewish Grandparents Network, um, notes in chat, what about story call? who Jane's uh, son started story for. So there are, are, are other means to, uh, to record your stories. Yeah, and we could, uh, of course, you know, for a teenager, we can always ask them their story. Yes. yes, yes. In the awakened brain, there are six stories of people, most of whom are grandparents actually, talking about the time in their life where they felt depressed or lost, very often in young adulthood or late adolescence and that they broke through to feel God's presence or deeper meaning in life. And through that period found their true north, the compass that would guide them for their biggest contribution in their lives. So those are, I'm thinking of the six stories, um, Tim, Tim Shriver, Stephen Rockefeller, about half of them are more than half, two thirds are grandparents and they're awakening stories. So it's sort of a model. They're only three, four pages, you know, of how this time around 18 or 20 or 25 was a breakthrough time. And it actually pointed me down the path of my life's journey. Right. Um, and, and on a last note, and then we will conclude, um, one, of our, uh, one of our friends, one of our members here has noted that there are other ways to tell the story. So for example, who, um, they create Zadie books where grandpa and the little and the kids, they he creates a book with pictures and so on, and that tells story with the child in the story, which of course makes that much more relevant. Uh, I think we are at we are at seven fifty, so we have to say goodbye. But this is terrible. We don't want to go. This has been wonderful. I would love to come back. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So it's a huge honor, a huge honor, a huge honor. Um, friends, we are recording the session. We will post it in our Facebook group. Uh, it's the Jewish Grandparents Network. Uh, it's a private Facebook group. I've put the link into chat. We, we welcome you and we hope you will join our community. Uh, and to Lisa, a thousand thanks. And David, thank you so much for a wonderful interview. To everybody, all our friends, good night. And we'll see you again soon. <laughs>